Hello everybody and welcome back. So in this video, what we're going to be doing is talking about socket programming in Python. Now what we're going to do and the goal of this video here is going to be to create an application where we can have multiple clients connect to a server and communicate with the server. So I'm not going to be doing anything crazy complex. We're not going to go in, into anything that's too specific. The objective is to give you the fundamental skills and understanding of how sockets work so that any application or project you want to use sockets in, you at least have a really good starting point to do that. And you're not kind of lost on how you get the initial setup done. That's kind of where a lot of people get confused here is their sockets are not connecting properly or they're getting all these kind of issues. So I'm going to go over some of the common problems that I've run into with sockets as well to hopefully kind of mitigate those for you guys. We're going to get started right away by actually just discussing a kind of basic overview of networking. So networking is very important to understand when we're dealing with sockets, because a lot of the time what will actually be wrong is nothing with your code, but something with your understanding of the networking or the understanding of your local network. So for this tutorial series, we're going to be running this server and this client just on our own computer and our own local network. What that means is anyone on our local network, so our router, right, your, your Wi-Fi network will be able to access and communicate with this server, but anyone outside of that will not. What I will do at the end of the video is show you and steer you in the right direction on how you can get this to work publicly over the internet, which means that anyone from any computer in the world can connect to your server. But that again is going to come near the end and you need to understand the difference between say a local area network and a public network and kind of how these networking things operate so that you can understand what it is that I'm doing here. So anyways, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to discuss the client server model and then a basic overview of networking. So sockets work on this client server model. Now what that means is we have one central location or one central process is what I'm going to call it, uh, which is called our server. Now, if we're talking about large companies like Google, obviously we know that they have millions or, you know, even actually probably tens of millions of servers. In our purpose, we're going to deal with one server, but just know that a lot of the stuff we do with one server, we can expand into multiple servers fairly easily just by changing the code up a little bit. But in our example, we're going to deal with one server. So the idea behind the client server model is you have a central location, which we're going to call the server, and then you have all of these clients that are kind of scattered all over the place. They're different devices, they're different computers, they're different networks, they're all around the world, right? And these are what we call our clients. Now, a good example that I typically like to talk about is games, because these are things that people have played a lot, and it's a very good example of socket programming. Um, not that games always will implement socket programming, but it's a good illustration of the client server model. When we talk about a game, the client, and you've probably heard this in gaming before, is your game. It's the instance of your game running on your computer. So let's use the famous example of Fortnite. If we're talking about how Fortnite works in terms of an online game, they have their central servers, and then they have all of these clients that are around the world. The clients are you, you are playing the game, you are a client. Now, obviously, you do not connect to another client's computer. In fact, that would be a large security risk if you connected directly to, say, you know, your competitor who's, you know, around the world, you connected to their computer. What you do is you connect to the central server that hosts all of the clients that are playing in your game or in your region or whatever it is. And the reason for that, well, there's a few different ones. Obviously, a central location is going to be faster in general than each client connecting to each other client's computer. Because if we're playing a game of 100 people, I can't connect to every single one of these computers um, and still have things working properly. But that's kind of the concept behind this. Another idea is that say we're playing a game and I connect directly to the other client. Well, that means I can cheat very easily because I can just send the client false information about my game state. That's pretty easy to do. And in fact, in most games, you can probably falsify your game state very easily. It just won't work because of the way that the server is set up. So we have this server in place to kind of handle and do all of this communication between these different clients. So the server connects to each individual client and then each client connects to the server. And what happens is messages are passed between the server and between the client. So let's say I have my little character here, right? And he decides he's going to move over to the right. 
Well, that is passed to the server in the form of some kind of command or some kind of message protocol, which we'll talk about in a second, to tell the server, hey, I moved to the right. Now, to make sure that this client is not cheating or falsifying its information, there's a few things that can happen on the server to do that. It can check previous states, it can check speed, it can make sure that the client is sending accurate information. And that is kind of what, uh, I don't know, maintains this secure idea behind this client server system. Uh, I hope that's giving you a little bit of an idea of what I mean, but the idea is that, you know, it sends its movement to the server and then the server transmits that information back to every single client and says, Hey, you know, client one moved to the right. Everyone should know that. So you can update that on your end and you can see that. And that's the idea behind the client server system. So in our example, we're going to have multiple clients connecting to the server. They're going to be sending messages to the server and the server will list out all of the messages so that we can see. Um, you know, when these messages came in and how they came in and all of that. Okay, so that's the idea behind the client server model. Now, obviously, in an online game, we're going to be connected to a server that is somewhere around the world. So that means we're going to connect over the internet, right? But in our local network, things happen a little bit differently. And we need to understand how our local network works to understand how the internet actually operates as a whole. So when we talk about our local network, what we have is a few different components. We obviously have the most vital component, I would say. I'm going to try to draw kind of a crazy version of this, which is our modem. Now, what the modem does, and typically, actually, the modem will be wired in to your internet connection, right? So if you want to install a modem, like a Rogers modem or a Bell modem or something like that, you typically need a technician to come to your house and run a wire into this modem that connects it to the internet. Now, these wires will go to some large cell tower. Um, you might have a satellite dish on your house. I don't know exactly how your internet operates or how it works. It might connect to a fiber optic line. It might do something like that. But the idea is this cable goes to your modem and gives your modem access to the internet. So then what do you do? Well, now they kind of have these modem router things that are combined, but typically you're going to have a router. So your router um, maybe looks like this. It has some antennas off of it, whatever. And we'll call this the router. And the router is what actually allows devices in your home to connect to the modem. So it plugs into the modem and the router transmits uh, these radio frequency waves or whatever waves they are. And you're able to connect to the router wirelessly, right? Obviously, you can connect wired as well if you have an Ethernet cable. But the idea behind a router is to allow you to wirelessly connect to your network. So maybe I have uh, like my phone up here. Maybe I have a computer or some device like these boxes are just going to be random devices. And the idea is that all of these connect to the router in some kind of way and some kind of protocol. And then this router communicates with the modem, gets information from the modem. The modem says, OK, what information do I need? It asks the Internet for that information. So it pings the satellite or whatever information comes back, sends it back to the router. The router sends it back to whatever client was asking for that information. So that's how this works on your local network. So there's something called IP addresses now, obviously. So your modem is given one what we call public IP address. So we have public IP address, excuse my handwriting. This has one. So times one public IP address for your modem that represents your physical location in the Internet, right? Your physical location on the world. Um, that's your modems IP address. It's that's important. <laughs> you just need to know that. Then within your local network, you have what's called a local IP address. So that so because your router needs to be able to differentiate between the different devices on the network so it can know which device to give information back to or to look information up for, it needs to know uh, or have some number that represents each of them. So you may have seen an IP address that looks something like this, 192.168.1, maybe it was a dot zero, maybe it's dot two, depending on what you're doing, uh, and then like 176, right? Something like that. Well, each device on your local network is given one of these IP addresses, okay? So that's something to understand. We have these local IP addresses. That's the way that the router communicates with each device on the network. And then we have the public IP address, which is given to the modem, which is the way the modem communicates with the Internet. And every time that you want to make a search on the Internet, you go through this process of pinging the router, router pinging the modem, modem pinging the Internet, Internet giving it back to the modem, giving it back to the router and giving it back to you. That's the process that you go through. And the reason you can do that is because you have this IP address so you can be differentiated on the network as an individual device. Now, when you have access points, it gets a little bit more confusing. But anyways, that's the basic idea behind networking. I could be butchering this slightly. I'm not an expert in this field. I'll make that clear. 
But just understand that this local IP address, which we call the IPv4 address, is different than the public IP address. So if I decide to run a what we call server off of a local IP address, what that means is any other computer on this local network, so that's connected to my router, will be able to see it and access it, right? Because if I'm connecting and running a server on this device, it's connected to the router, which means any other devices connected to the router can access this. But anything that's not connected to this router, so on a different network, cannot see that. So that's important to understand. However, if I decide to run a server on my public IP address, so from the modem, right, then what that means is anything around the world can connect to this because it's running on a different IP address. So that's the idea behind networking uh, and behind this client server model. I hope that makes sense. What we're going to do is run our networks on or run our servers on our local IP address. But later again, I will show you how to do that on the public IP address. All right, so now we're ready to actually start writing some code. So we're going to start by programming out the server, and we're not really going to be able to test a lot of this code until we write a bunch of it. So I'm going to be explaining through exactly what I'm doing to make sure you understand, but just kind of follow with me, even though you're not wondering if something's going to work yet or not, because we really can't test this until we do a significant amount of the code that we actually need to write. So notice that I'm in VS Code now. I'm going to recommend that you use an IDE for this tutorial series, something like PyCharm, VS Code, uh, maybe using like some NetBeans thing or something, I don't know, whatever IDE you're going to use, because we're going to have to run multiple instances of Python. We're going to have a server running and then we're going to have a client running on our own computer. We'll test it on another computer later on, but for the purpose of actually, you know, testing and working this out and all that, we're going to do it on the same computer. So the first thing we're going to do for our socket script and notice I just have a server.py and client.py script doesn't matter if they're in the same directory or not is import socket and import threading. Now for any of you that don't know what threading is, threading is essentially a way of creating multiple what we call threads within one Python program. So typically if I did something like, you know, if I import time, and I did something like time.sleep1 and then print hello like that, then we would have to wait for this time.sleep to finish. So this wait, we'd have to wait one second before we were able to print hello. But if I run each of these pieces of code in say a different thread, what that means is while one piece of code is waiting or it's not doing something, the other piece of code or the other thread can run. So we're actually going to put all of the kind of message handling stuff in separate threads for each client that connects to our server so that a client is not waiting for another client to say send a message or receive a message or something like that before it's able to access the server and communicate with the server. So we'll talk about that more when that happens, but just kind of follow along that a thread allows us to separate code out so that it's not waiting for other code to finish before it's able to execute. All right, so the first thing I'm going to need to do is define a port. So when we run a server, we need to pick a port that we're going to run it on. Now, it's kind of tricky to explain what port to run on. The port that I typically run on is 5050. I don't know the exact numbers of all the ports and what they do, but I'm pretty sure above a certain threshold, maybe above port 4000, all of those ports on your computer become inactive or not used. I think there's something like 10,000 ports. Again, I don't really know. You're going to have to look up the port specific information if you want, but a safe bet is usually to run on port 5050. This is just because we're trying to pick a port essentially that's not being used for something else. A common example of a port is something like port 8080 or port 80. Those are HTTP ports, I believe, which means that is your communication with like websites or with web browsers, um, anything that's communicating over HTTP, which is essentially the entire internet as of now. Okay, so we're going to do port equals 5050, and then we're going to say server equals. Now here we have a few different options. So the first option is to go to your command prompt and to type IP config. And I, a lot of people in previous videos were like, oh, you show me your IP address. Typing IP config does not show you my public IP address. So don't worry about that. This shows the local network information. So if you go on your command prompt or if you're on Mac, I think it's IF config, not IP config. If you're on Windows, you can find something that says IPv4 address. Now what that stands for is your local IPv4 address. You can see that I'm connected to Rogers Internet here, right? Uh, and this is my local IPv4 address. So I'm going to copy this 192.168.1.26 copy that and I'm going to paste that in here as my server. The reason for that is because I want to run this on my local network off of this device. This is the device the server is going to run on. So I need to choose the IP address of this device. If you try to pick a different IP address that it can't access, that is not going to work. Now, another way to do this 
to just type the same line again is to actually type server equals and then in this case you're going to say socket dot get host by name so i guess this is actually get host by name and then in here you're going to say socket dot and then here get host name no, sorry, I just had to look at my other screen to make sure that was right. But what this block of code actually does is get this IP address automatically for you. So let's say we want to uh, run this server on a different device. If we just hard code this IP address in, then we're going to need to change that every time that we move the script over. So what I typically like to do is this option that I just wrote. So we essentially say socket dot get host by name and then socket dot get host name. If I can get this autocomplete thing to uh, go away. What this means is get the IP address of this computer by name. And then we say, okay, so what is the name that we're going to look up? Well, that is the get host name, which is just the name of our computer. You can print out these two lines if you want to see what they do. In fact, let's actually just do it. If I print out server and I run this here, we can see that we get 192.168.1.26. And if I decide to just print out this line here, we can see that what this actually gives us is in this case desktop r6knokf so it's just some name that represents your computer on the network so we're saying get the pretty much ip address by host name and then get host name so it gets that for us so anyways that gives us our server okay so now that we've determined the port and the ip address that we want to run this server on we need to actually make a socket that's going to allow us to open up um, kind of this device to other connections so the first step is pick the port and pick the server and then pick the socket and bind the socket to that address so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say server in lower cases is equal to socket dot socket like this is how you make a new socket and the first argument here is actually the family of socket that we want now family kind of stands for category that's the way i like to describe it and there's a lot of different categories that we can pick now the types are typically uh prefixed with af like this and you can see when i type socket dot socket and then socket dot af the first option is inet which is actually what we're going to use this pretty much tells the socket what type of IP address or what type of address are we going to be accepting or looking for for specific connections. So you can see that I can pick INET6, which I believe stands for IPv6 addresses instead of IPv4. And then there's things like packets, Bluetooth, Netlink. You can do file objects. There's all kinds of different sockets you can create. So in this case, we're going to do socket.af underscore INET. And then what I'm going to do in here is say socket dot stream or right? i believe it's dot sock underscore stream i'm not really going to discuss exactly what this means this is kind of the standard option but it means we're streaming data through the socket there's different ways of sending data through a socket but again that gets into more advanced networking protocols which i don't really want to cover right here so this is what we've done we've created our um our socket now we've picked the type so we've said it's an afi net which means over the internet and then we pick the method which is sock stream um, and I actually, sorry, this is family and this is type. I mean, you can kind of think of this as the type of socket as well, but it just specifies the type of addresses that we're looking for. Okay. So now what we need to do is actually bind this to an address. So what we're going to do up here is we're going to say ADDR in all capitals. And notice I'm doing all capitals just because these are constant values. And I'm going to say ADDR equals, and in this case, we're going to type server port. So when we bind our socket to a specific address, it needs to be in a tuple. So it needs to have the server first and then the port in which that server is running off of. So when we bind this now, we can say server.bind like that, and then simply put ADDR in here, which now means we've bound this socket to this address. So anything that connects to this address now will you know, hit this socket. That, that's essentially the objective. Okay, so we have that and now what we're going to do is see how we can actually make this uh, socket get set up for listening and just print out a few things and let it wait for new connections. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit here and what I'm going to do is define, I want to zoom in one more, I want to say defined handle client as a function. We're going to put in here address and then we're going to put connection like that or actually we'll put connection so con c o n n and then a d d r and then we'll just simply put pass and then we're going to say defined uh start so start is just going to start the socket server for us we'll just make it in a function to make things a little bit cleaner so we'll put start and then we'll simply put pass in here so at the bottom of my program what i like to do is call start and right before i call start what i want to do is print and say starting i like to just make some nice output here and say server is 
starting dot 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 just so when we look in the console we can see kind of what's happening in this case the server is starting okay so inside of start here what i'm going to do now is essentially write the code that's going to allow our server to start listening for connections and then handling those connections and passing them to handle client which will run in a new thread so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say s or not s server dot listen which means okay we are now listening for new connections we'll set that up and then we're going to say while true because this is going to go in an infinite loop essentially it's going to continue to listen until you know we don't want to listen anymore until the server crashes or until we execute it or turn it off we're going to say while true say server dot accept like that but here we're going to say addr connection equals server.connect and i think that's right actually i've messed it up it's con comma addr and the reason for this is essentially what this line of code does is it's it it blocks and what that means is this line will wait like we'll wait on this line of code here for a new connection to the server when a new connection occurs we will store the address of that connection so what ip address and what port it came from and then we will store an actual object that's going to allow us to send information back to that connection so that's what con stands for you can see that it's giving me socket here uh, unused variable connection so this is actually a socket object that's going to allow us to communicate back to the connection or the thing that connected and this is simply just the information about the connection so what port and what ip address uh, connected to the server so when that happens what i'm going to do is start a new thread which is equal to handle client so a thread of this function and this function here will handle all of the communication between the client and between the server from now on so this little function here is meant to simply handle new connections and kind of distribute those to where they need to go whereas here we'll handle the individual connection between the client and the server so one client and one server so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say thread equals threading uh, dot thread this is the threading module in python 3 by the way so if you have python 2 this likely will not work for you i'm going to say target equals in this case the name of the function so handle clients no brackets notice i don't have any brackets there and i'm going to say args equals in here con addr so essentially what I'm saying is, okay, so when a new connection occurs, we are going to pass that connection to handle client. We'll give handle client. So we'll say target is handle client, right? This new thread. That's what that means. Arguments are what arguments are we passing to the function? So in this case, connection and address, and then we'll simply start the thread. So thread dot start like that. Now, I often like to see how many active connections we have on the server. So what I usually do is after I start a new thread is simply print the amount of active connections currently just so that we can see that. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say print and we'll just do a print a new line here and we'll say uh, active connections like that in all capital. I'll make this an F string and then we're simply going to say threading dot active like this active count minus one now what this tells us is how many threads are active on this process or in this python process the amount of threads will represent the amount of clients connected because we will create a new thread for each new client but since there's one thread running always which is this start thread to listen for new connections we'll subtract one which means that this will tell us there is one active connection when there's two threads running right that's the idea we might need to move this line of code later but for now we'll leave it here and then we'll now go into uh, start handling handle client so since handle client is in its own thread this is going to run for each client just remember this function will be running in parallel or not in parallel really but kind of concurrently for each client so the first thing that we're going to do is simply print a new connection so we're going to say print and then new connection like that and then here we'll do another f string and we'll say who connected so we'll say addr connected just so that we get some information in our server the next thing that we'll do is we'll set up a while loop and we'll say while true actually we'll say connected equals true and we'll say while connected like that so while connected then in here we're going to wait to receive information from the client and when we receive information from the client we're going to do something with that and simply print it to the screen so what i'm going to say is uh, message equals and then in this case we're going to say con 
like that dot RCV. So dot receive. And then we actually need to put in here how many bytes we want to receive from the client. Now, this is going to bring us into talking about message protocols, which we're going to do in just a second. But the idea here is this line of code again is what we call a blocking line of code, which means that we will not pass this line of code until we receive a message from our client. So that's why it's important that we have these in threads to make sure that we're not blocking other clients from potentially connecting because these lines, so con.receive and um, server.accept are blocking lines of code. So receive is saying, okay, we're going to receive a message from the client. We receive that from this socket like that, which means wait till something is sent over the socket. But what we need to put in the brackets here is how many bytes we're going to take. So how many bytes we're going to accept. Now, how are we going to know that? So the idea behind how many bytes is like we might send a message like hello to the server, but we might also send a message like hello, like that to the server, right? And clearly this message is a lot longer, takes up more bytes than the other message. So how are we going to know how many bytes to receive from the client, sorry, not the server, if, you know, if we're just guessing, right? We need to come up with some kind of protocol, some method of sending messages that tells us how many bytes we're going to be receiving. So what we do is we create what's called a header. Now I'm going to talk about what a header is in a second, but what we're going to do up here is define a fixed length header of what we're going to call 64 bytes. Now what this means is what we're actually going to do is the first message to the server every single time from the client is going to be a header of length 64 that tells us the length of the message that's going to come next. So essentially we're going to say, all right, since we don't know how big a message is going to be, we're going to say that the first message to the server every single time needs to be a message of length 64. What that means is that it always, no matter how big this message actually is, needs to be length 64, right? So we'll have to do that on the client side later, but just know that the header size we're picking is 64. And these 64 bytes that we're sending are going to have a number in them that represents the length of the amount of bytes for the message that we're about to receive. So essentially, say we're going to um, send the message hello. This isn't really five bytes, but say this is five bytes. The first thing we'll send to the server is five, and we'll pad that message so that it's 64 bytes long. And then we'll read that. We'll say, okay, so we're going to be receiving the number five. So we're going to be receiving five bytes of information, and then we'll receive again five bytes. So that means we'll send this first message, receive it on the server, and the server will wait to receive now the next message, which will be of length of whatever it sent in the first message. This will make more sense once we get through it, but hopefully that gives you an idea of what I'm trying to accomplish here. So the first thing that we're actually going to say is message length, because we're going to follow this protocol, right, is going to be equal to con.receive and then header. Now header means 64. The only issue with picking a fixed length header this small is that if we send a message that is actually, <laughs> essentially we need to be able to represent the length of the message that's going to come with 64 bytes. Now I actually don't know what that means uh, in terms of the actual numeric value, but if we were sending a really large message, we may potentially run into the issue where our header is actually too small to represent the length of the message that's about to come. We won't in our example, but just keep that in mind. That is a potential concern of the way that we're doing things. Okay, so we'll say message length equals con dot receive header. And then what we're going to do is actually decode this because every time we send a message, we need to encode it into a byte format. And we're going to encode that with a or decode that with a UTF form. So I'm going to say format up here equals and then here we're going to say utf hyphen eight just so that we have that as a constant we can change that later if we want so we'll say decode format which essentially means decode this message from its bytes format into a string using utf8 and then what we're going to do is convert that to an integer so we're going to say okay so uh message underscore length like that equals an int of message length and then we're going to receive the next message so we'll say the actual message is going to be equal to con dot receive and in here this is going to be message length same thing dot decode format uh, like that if i could type why am i typing so horribly today okay format there you go so con dot receive message length dot decode format so the first message tells us how long the message is that's coming so we use that, convert it to an integer, and then put that in here as how many bytes we're going to be receiving for the actual message. So then we should know that this message is accurate. So what we can do is simply print in here and we'll say 
put an F string. I'm just going to put EDDR, which is the address of the person and then what they said. So in this case, MSG. So we received a message from them. We'll print out ADDR in brackets and then whatever the messages that they sent. Now, an important thing that we need to do is actually handle how to close a connection. So we want to make sure that when a client leaves, there's some protocol that we've come up with to make sure that we handle their disconnection cleanly. So yes, they could just disconnect and not tell the server that they're disconnecting. That wouldn't really cause that many issues. But when they want to reconnect later, we might run into a problem that the server already has them connected. And since they didn't cleanly disconnect, when they try to connect, it's going to say, hey, we can't connect you because on our end, it seems like you're already connected, even though they may not be. So the way that we do this is we come up with some kind of message that we send to notify the server that we're going to disconnect. So in this case, we're going to call this the disconnect underscore message. And we're just going to make this a um, exclamation point and then disconnect. Now you can make this message whatever you want, but this means when we receive this message, we will close the connection and disconnect the client from the server. So to do that, we're going to say if here, so if MSG equals equals disconnect message, then we'll simply say break, or we can say connected equals false, right? We can do whatever one we want. Uh, I'll just do connected equals false. And then, yeah, we can print out the disconnect message. That's fine. Then what we're going to say is con dot close. What that means is close the current connection, cleanly disconnect. Everything should work fine. And in fact, um, yeah, that should actually be fine. And I think that might be the server completed. Let me just look and make sure that everything is fine here. I believe it actually is. And we're good to go. All right, so this is the server. The server is complete. Let me show you what happens when I run it. You can see that we got server is starting like this. Now, what I'll actually do is I'll close that right now. We'll add one more line just to tell us what um, what IP address the server is running on, just so we know. So after we start listening, we'll say print. Um, we'll say, I don't know, something like this. Listening. So server is listening on. And then in this case, we'll put the IP address. So we'll say F string. And then here we will do server like that. Just so we can see what IP address is actually running on, we'll do server. Uh, and that should be it for the server. Let's run this and see servers listening on 192.168.1.26. So this should work for all of you guys. Again, you don't need to install any packages or anything. I know I didn't mention that, but when you run this, if you're getting an issue, recheck your code, look at what I've done here, because chances are you've typed something wrong or you have a firewall or something on your computer that's not letting you run this. If you're getting an issue and it's saying like some socket issue, like you cannot uh, run on this support or whatever it is or cannot run on this um, IP address, then make sure you disable any firewall on your Windows Explorer or, or your Windows, whatever you want to call it. I don't know, Windows Defender, because that may be causing the issue. But anyways, now we're going to move on to the client and see how we can actually connect to the server. So here we're going to import, in this case, socket. And then I don't actually don't think we need anything else on the client side. So we're going to define some of the constants we've had before. So we're going to keep the header of 64. We're going to keep the port like that. So let's go header port. We need this format and this disconnect message. So let's copy those. And then what we need is obviously the server. Now the server here will change depending on what uh, server we're connecting to. So in this case, we're going to connect to 1.2.168.1.26. Again, remember this number will likely be different for you. It will probably not be 26. It will be whatever your IPv4 address is that you found from terminal or from the command line. But you can always write this line here, which will give you the IP address of your actual machine, right? So that will tell you which one you will be able to run on. And then if you print that out, you can see that and type that in here. Okay, so we have that. Now all I'm going to do is set up the socket for the client. So we've done this already pretty much. We're going to say socket equals socket dot socket in here we're going to say socket dot af underscore i net if i could spell socket correctly that was just a butcher then we'll say socket again dot in this case sock underscore stream okay so we'll do that and now we have the socket set up here and now we need to connect to the server so to do that what we're going to do is say socket and i can't name the socket what am i doing name that client my apologies guys client dot connect so notice instead of bind we're connecting now in this case we need to define addr up here again so addr equals in this case server and port 
So we'll connect to ADDR like that. And now we have officially connected to the server. So actually, let's take a pause here and test this and see if this is working when we connect. Because notice I print new connection, right? Connected. And that should actually show up and we should see that. So let's run the server. Make sure that the server is running. A common issue is people don't have the server running and they try to connect and it doesn't work. I mean, obviously, yes, that's not going to work when you try to connect to a server that's not running. Uh, now what I'm going to do is just go on my command prompt because I don't think VS Code lets you run multiple Python interpreters at the same time, although I could be wrong. Let's cd into socket tutorial like that. And let's go Python. In this case, this was client. So when we do that, we get invalid uh, literal for int with base 10 in handle client. OK, so that's our right. Let's just have a look here. OK, so what we're going to do here is just make a quick fix on the server because you saw that message that was popping up. It was saying invalid literal for into with base 10. I guess it's not popping up anymore because I closed the server, uh, but it was saying invalid literal for into with base 10. And the reason for that is when we connect, a message is sent to the server telling us that we connected, but what we're doing here is we're trying to handle immediately the message that's being sent with the length of the message that's about to come, which we haven't yet sent. So we need to make sure that we're getting a valid message before we try to convert that message to an integer, because otherwise we're going to run into an issue. So what I'm going to do is simply just say if message length, which simply means if this message um, has some content, because essentially when we connect, when we receive, we'll receive nothing the first time because when we had connected, the message <laughs> is it, it's kind of it's difficult to explain exactly why this happens. But when you connect, some kind of message is sent. It's not really a valid message. It's kind of like a blank message. So when we try to convert that into an integer, we run into an issue. So we're just going to make sure that we get an actual message here by checking if this is not none. That's what this line means here. And if it's not none, then we'll do this protocol that we talked about before. So let's run this now. Let's rerun the server. Uh, servers listening on that port. OK, so let's go here. Let's run this and notice that we don't get an issue this time. We get active connections. One one nine two dot one six eight dot one dot two six connected. Boom. Awesome. OK, so now that we're connected to the server, what we actually need to do is come up with a way to send messages. So we're just going to start by creating a define send function. We're going to take MSG as a parameter and we're going to start by saying message equals in this case MSG dot encode in format. Now, this is because when we send messages, we need to encode them into a bytes format. So what encode actually does, let's see if it gives me that pop up or it's not, of course, is encode this string into a bytes like object. So then we can actually send the bytes through the socket and that's you know working. That's how we have to do that. Now, since we need to follow this protocol where the first message we send is the length of the message that's about to come, we need to get the length of this. So we'll say MSG underscore length equals in this case, the len of message. And then what we're going to do is we're actually going to encode this as a string. So we're going to say send length equals in this case, str of message underscore length like that dot encode. And we're going to encode that with the format of UTF eight. Then what we're going to do is now pad this to make this length 64. So right now the send length, which is the first message that we're going to send representing the length of this message, right? The one that we actually want to send. We need to make sure that that message is 64 bytes long. So we don't necessarily know that it's going to be 64 bytes long because it's just going to be some integer that we're sending. Maybe it's like five, 10, 20, whatever. It's telling us the length of the bytes. That doesn't mean that the message we're sending is that long. So we need to now find the length of this message. We need to take 64 and subtract this from 64 to figure out how much we need to pad this so that it is of length 64. So we're going to say padded send length is equal to, in this case, send underscore length. Uh, actually, I guess we can just do, we could just do this. We could just actually add it as padding. So send underscore length plus equals in this case, we're going to say B and then we're going to do a blank string with a space. Now what this means is the byte representation of this string. So since we just want to add blank spaces, um, just we want to add padding to make it the correct length, we can just add a space. So we'll say B and then a space sentence for byte space multiplied by in this case, we're going to say header minus the len in lower cases 
of send length. So we're going to get the length of this. We're going to subtract it from the header and then we're going to add that amount to this so that it's like 64. Then all we need to do is say, um, in this case, client dot send send length, then client dot send in this case, it's going to be that message. So this should hopefully work. So we can try this and do send hello like that. Actually, let's just do hello world. So we can see how that works. I don't think the server's still running. I'll reboot it. Uh, it is still running. So actually, let's just reboot that now. So we see the server is running. Let's go to our command prompt. Let's go and run this client script. And we see that we get active connections one and hello world popping up. So that actually means that we did this correctly. What happened was this is the server script. Notice that that happened when I pressed enter here. We we're able to send that text. We decoded that on the server side and then that was printed and shown. So I can actually send more than one message, obviously, if I would like. So let's now handle the disconnection message. That's kind of next. So I'll shut down this server. We're going to send the disconnect message and see what happens now after we send hello world. Let's send a few more actually. So we'll send hello everyone. Hello Tim like that. So let's run this server now and then run that and see what happens when we send that disconnect message. So if we go here, a new Python client up high. Hello world. Hello everyone. Hello Tim. Disconnect. And then we've disconnected from the server. And if we decide to reconnect again, which we can totally do by just running the script again, we will see that the active connection is one. It's not two because we actually exited that thread um, and got rid of it when we saw that disconnect message. So that's the basics behind sending those messages. So now what I'm going to do is show you how we can actually connect with multiple clients um, and how we can make it. For example, if I just do like input like this, you have to press space to send it. So let's do that actually first and show you how that works. So input like that. Here we go. Now, if I run client, we'll see that it shows hello world. When I press enter, it shows hello everyone. Enter again. Hello, Tim. Disconnect. That's great. So let's run an instance of client there. We're going to run one more in another command prompt. If I could get to the folder, so CD socket tutorial python client.py. And then notice we now get active connections to it's saying hello world from someone else. If I go to this script and I hit enter, it says hello everyone. And notice that's from a different number than this number. It's the same IP address because it's the same computer, but it's giving us a different port number. Uh, actually, I don't think that's a port number, but something anyways. And if I now go from this one and I hit enter, uh, if I can get that in here, what's happening on this client script? Something's going wrong here. Uh, enter. There we go. Gets hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Come here, hit enter, disconnect. Come here, hit enter, disconnect. So we have multiple clients connected. It doesn't matter when they're sending messages. These will still work fine. Uh, I don't know why I had the bug before. I think it was just this command prompt window is glitching out. But that is the basic idea behind this client server system and sending and handling messages. OK, so now I've shown you how we can send messages from the client to the server. But how about from the server to the client? Well, it's actually quite easy. And in fact, it's the exact same thing, except just going the other way. So if we want to send a message back to the client, what I'll do is I'll just implement in here a simple send. So we'll literally just go con dot send. And here we can say something like, I don't know, message received. If I can spell received properly, I uh, don't even know if that's right anymore. Dot in code format. So all we're going to do is simply send this message encoded with that format. So every time that a message is sent to us, we will encode that message and send it back. Now to see that sending back, oh, I've already added this in here. Forgot that I put that there when I was testing in between the break. What we can do is merely write print client dot receive and then some number in here. Uh, ideally, we would use the same protocol we've used to send a message to the server to send one back to the client. So that fixed length header. But because I'm lazy and we're getting near the end of the video, I don't want to do that. You guys understand how that works. So I've just put a large number here to make sure that we'll be able to handle whatever message is sent back. But the idea is after we receive a message, we will send back to the um, client a message and then they can receive that by writing client dot receive. If this number is long enough, obviously they will be able to receive the length of the message. We will print that out. In fact, we can actually decode this to make sure this is not in byte format. So decode and then we'll put format like that. And then we will see that message is received every time that we send a message. And if we don't get that message received, that means something was wrong on the server side. 
Now, a lot of you are probably saying, and I'll show you this, how this works in a second. Well, what if I want to send the messages from the other client to the other client? To do that, what you would need to do is store a list of all of the messages globally that are sent. So essentially, every time a message is received from client one, what you would need to do is add that to a list. And then what you would do is send that back to each client. So if you want to do that, you can make another um, like protocol or another I don't know, thread that does that. So send to every single client or what you can do is check in a specific client itself what messages it's up to date with. So you can say, OK, um, have you seen the previous message that this person sent and that person sent? If they haven't, you send it to them, right? So there's different ways to do this. Um, that's when you start getting into more complicated things in sockets. But the idea is, right, you know, we can send things from the server to the client the same way that the client can send things to the server. So let's run this. Let's go server. Um, let's see what's an issue here. We run into something. Let's just re do this one more time. Okay, so server is listening. Let's go to our command prompt. Let's run a Python client.py. And notice it says MSG received. So we hit enter, message received again, message received, disconnect, boom, everything is working, we are good. So that is how that works in terms of sending messages back. Now, if you want to send something that's not a string, so you want to send, say, like an object, then what you can do is you can send messages that are JSON serialized, or you can send messages that are pickled. Now, I forget the way that pickle works. Um, totally. So I'm not actually going to show you, but the idea is you can import pickle and you can look this up. There's tons of stuff online that shows you how to do this. If you import pickle, you can pickle like a Python object. So an entire object, like you make your own custom object, you can pickle that, which is a way of serializing it and then send that through the socket um, back to the server where the server can unpickle it and use it. So if you want to send things that aren't strings, that's a way that you can do it. Typically, we're just going to be sending strings, which is what I've shown here. But this should hopefully give you enough information to make some kind of socket applications. Again, I know a lot of you are going to want to send messages between clients. So the way to do that is to globally keep track of all the messages that are sent. And then within the thread here, right, you're going to check if you need to send messages from other clients to the, the current client. And you can also do something like a constant ping command. So you can have the client constantly send the server like a read, read, read command or some specific string. And whenever it sends that, the client should or the server should spit back to it any new messages or any new information. So it's constantly pinging and asking the server for information, right? Okay, so what I'm going to do now is show you how this works on different computers. So I'm going to run the server script. Notice I don't have anything else running on my computer. I'm really not trying to trick you guys, I promise. It's there's no command prompt windows. It's, I'm just going to run the server on this computer. So servers here, we can see server starting, servers listening, watch the server output. Now, while I'm still on camera here, oof, I hit everything while I'm doing that. I have my Mac here. Now I've downloaded the client script onto my Mac. So what I'm going to do is simply send to the server here. Um, like I'm going to connect to the server from my Mac and show you that it actually works and you see the message. So all I'm doing, I'm not sure if you guys can see this. I have a terminal window open. I have the client script here. I'm going to hit enter on here and you should see new connection, active connections one. Hello from my MacBook is the first message that is sent. Now, if I hit enter again, notice right when I hit enter. So as my hand goes down, new message, enter again. Yes, Tim, disconnect. So I changed a little bit on here just so that you could see that this is different. The only modifications I made was the messages that I was sending. Since this computer is on the same Wi-Fi network as this computer, this works, right? Because we ran this off of this IP address. So all I had to do was connect to that from my Mac. And there we go. That works. Now, if you wanted this to work over the internet, all you have to do, let me put this MacBook away for a second, is look up your public IP address. So to do that, you can go on Google and search my public IP address. It will pop up. Then in your server script, what you're going to do is change uh, this here. So you're going to change this, remove this to simply be that IP address, whatever it is. And then from any device anywhere that has access to the internet, obviously it's important that we're connected to the internet here. You can put that IP address in and you will be able to connect. Now you might run into some issues with firewalls. That will mean you have to deactivate firewalls specifically, probably on your server computer, 
potentially on the client computer as well but that should work. And that is the idea behind all of this. So that has been this tutorial. I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you learned a little bit about sockets and I hope at minimum you can send messages now from one computer to another over the same network, which personally I find very fascinating that I can just do that alone sitting in my bedroom. I can make a client server system. So anyways, that has been it. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did make sure you leave a like subscribe to the channel and I will see you guys in another YouTube video.